Great. So good morning. I'm going to turn over the introductions and everything to Dr. Jen Wise, the co-coordinator. Good morning, everybody. Yes, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you all for uh, attending and a special thank you to Professor Michelle Taylor. Um, I would like to introduce our speaker for our October NGOMA series. Uh, Professor Michelle Taylor is a Philadelphia-based feminist writer, public speaker, broadcaster, community activist, and semi-retired social worker. She's an award-winning blogger and the author of four books, including the critically acclaimed best-selling Reclaiming Our Space, How Black Feminists Are Changing the World from the Tweets to the Streets. Michelle is a PhD student in Temple University's Africology and African American Studies Department. Michelle's research and career focuses include hip hop culture, black motherhood, social work, and social justice organizing. As a freelance writer, she has been featured in Time, the New York Times Essence, the Washington Post, and has had columns for Ebony and Zora magazines. In 2020, she was named one of the 76 most influential people in Philadelphia. And so we welcome Professor Michelle Taylor to give her presentation on how social media is redefining community for women of the African diaspora. Thank you so much. Um, I'm one of those people I cringe when people read my bio because I'm like, I'm just here to talk. Let's talk. Um, so I'm just so happy to see so many people here. Um, thank you, thank you, thank you, um, Dr. Cooper, for you know having the conversation and bringing me here. Um, I'm honored. I have spoken at Widener before as a social worker when I, when I was doing that fun stuff, um, and I'm so happy to be back. Um, and and, and in, in this particular capacity, I get to talk about something that I love talking about every single day, all day long, and that's Black women. So I'm I'm honored to be here. Um, I will share my my screen. I I, I admit that I, I I make these slides because people like visuals, but I really want to talk and I want this to be a conversation. And so you can hold until the Q and A, but I'm gonna kind of zip through some of this stuff and then we'll get into it. Is that all right? Is that how we do? All right, call and response. Everybody here. All right, love it. Okay, so let me get my stuff together. <laughs> let me share my screen. Um, hold on one second. Okay, so share, and then we're here, and we're going to present, and then boom. All right, everybody can see? Oh, excellent. All right, so we're, we're today we are definitely talking about how social media is redefining community for women of the African diaspora. And I say the African diaspora because I'm not making this U.S.-centric. Um, in my research and, and work over the years, I have learned that this has been such an important thing for us all around the world. Um, so, you know, we're going to we're going to talk about that a bit. Uh, a little bit about me. You've heard a little bit of an introduction. I am a PhD student at Temple University. Um, I'm very interested in uh, representations of Black motherhood, um, particularly what in, in, in uh, cinema. Um, so I'm looking at cinema and kind of uh, studying looking for an Afrocentric approach to analyzing cinema that can serve us if we wanna talk about how you know Black women are represented in cinema. So I'm kind of doing work around that. Um, I have written a few books. I'm working on uh, two more right now. We're getting those sold. Um, I did, I'm the founder of uh, St. Clopas Summer School, which is an Afrocentric summer academy. Um, I've been honored to have uh, people like Dr. Nod Dove and R Ronaldo Anderson and other people come and, and teach classes at my school uh, for two years in a row now. So I'm really excited about that. Um, I am a co-creator of Black Girl Missing Podcast. It is the only podcast that exists specifically to talk about Black girls ages 0 to 17 who have gone missing. Um, and we have three seasons out. You can listen wherever you want. I am a retired social worker. I spent most of my time in New York City working in the housing and houselessness se sector as well as um, the mental health sector. So I do call myself a mental health um, social worker. I am also um, an advocate for mental health uh, improvement in care and treatment and support uh, as somebody who lives with psychiatric disabilities. You can go to my website. I'm also known as Feminista Jones. Some of you know that. Some of you don't know that. That's okay. <laughs> um, we're going to talk about building community. We're going to look at how and why. Why, you know, how are women coming together? What does that look like to build community in digital spaces? And why is this important in the 21st century? And then I'm going to look at some examples of um, particularly activism that has brought 
uh, Black women around the world together and has really amplified our voices. All right, so what do we know? Social media has absolutely become one of the most powerful, if not the most powerful tool for connecting and coalition building right now. Um, and African women around the world are at the forefront of this work and lead all other groups in terms of utilization. All the research shows who is using social media the most, Black women, <laughs> right? Um, we are on Twitter. We are uh, using Twitter and those platforms as I write in my book, Reclaiming Our Space, that Twitter is, uh, it works for us because it is very call and response. And it is, it mimics our natural way of conversing with each other, which I found, I wrote a, a whole section about, um, you know, this idea of putting out a thought and someone comes in response to that thought or they'll tweet the thought, you know, quote tweet it and add something to it. There's a, a bit of an amen corner kind of going. And that's just how we talk and, and all the, oh girl, you right, you know, I got you, boom, boom, boom. It's natural for us, right? So that's why we have really been able to dominate Twitter um, in terms of conversations, even to the point where our conversational patterns have influenced how they shape the platform, right? So back in the day, for example, um, those threads, like if you've ever been on Twitter and read Twitter threads, they didn't exist. We made them. See, my homegirl Trudy is one of the, the first people to do that, the first Black woman to do that. And they credit a white man for creating the threads, by the way. But it was my friend Trudy. Um, and she figured out how to manipulate the, the platform to connect her tweets. Brilliant. Of course, they credit a white man for that. Um, so just even how we have done things now, Twitter allows you to do threading automatically, right? So we kind of, you know, use Twitter to, to, to change uh, the culture, really. Uh, we use Instagram. We love a good picture. We love an inspirational message. We love going out there and telling other sisters, you're going to be all right. You know, like lean into each other, love each other, support each other. Instagram is one of those um, platforms that used to be specifically about posting photos. Um, but when Instagram and, and Facebook merged, it all kind of became one thing, right? But it doesn't matter because sisters have figured it all out anyway. <laughs> so we do use Instagram to, um, to build community and to connect with each other. I just posted a message the other day that has had like 25,000 views um, because, uh, or impressions, because it was an inspirational message that people needed to hear. And there's something about Black women, we just know what people need to hear and we are just delivering those messages. So Instagram is strong for that. Um, TikTok, I am not as on the TikTok as I probably should be, but the young women got it, right? You go to TikTok, you are going to get all of the knowledge that you need, all of the good stuff. And so these young Gen Z uh, sisters from all over are really breaking down these like intricate concepts and teaching people and creating these kinds of educational spaces. And um, they are doing social commentary and they are all working with each other. And it is just fantastic to see. Facebook is actually where we, we use the most. Uh, Facebook, everybody jokes about Facebook being old school and falling behind, even though out of all of these, it is the oldest. Um, Facebook still above and beyond remains the most used uh, social media platform. And we're definitely over there doing some amazing work and community building. And one thing about Facebook is that, you know, you, you are bringing in people that you know, but you can also invite people that you may not necessarily know personally, but who are still interested in the conversations that you're creating. So that's, that's a good thing about Facebook. And Facebook lets you type a lot. Um, a lot of these other uh, platforms are really limited in characters and how much time you can use, et cetera. Facebook allows people to say more. So some people may like to use Facebook more because of that. Snapchat is still out there doing its thing. Um, I don't use it anymore, um, quite frankly, but I know that people are still using it and uh, people are definitely still connecting on that. And then there's the message boards and subscription services. And the message boards are really important when we think of a, a platform like OK Player, where um, Angela Nissel, UPenn graduate, um, kind of brought that all together in support of the music group The Roots. Um, message boards are where people go and have, have been having these like really important conversations about everything from pop culture to activism to self-care to you know beauty and what have you just spaces that are created for us to come together and talk amongst ourselves. Of course, there's other participants, there's, uh, there's always observers. 
you know, Basie and Prosser and all of them taught us that they always gonna be watching, but <laughs> You know, these, these message boards really allow, um, we, back in the day, you had things like naturality and other places that really supported uh, Black women coming together. And oh, sorry, if I don't move in here, the light goes out. So I got to like, <laughs> I got to move. So that may happen occasionally, y'all. <laughs> I love the energy conservation though. Um, and then there's subscription services. You have Substack, you have Patreon, you have these other uh, places that like I, I have one of those where people actually pay to support uh, the, the work of uh, Black women. And for those of us that are marginalized and kept out of those more mainstream places, this is really supportive and it helps build community because you can have these conversations and they're kind of private. They're really for selective people who are willing to support you uh, financially. So you know, these are some of the, the main ones. Tumblr used to be a big, big, big one, but Tumblr has fallen by the wayside, but that used to really be a, a big one for, um, especially for uh, younger Black women. All right. So by the numbers, we have some numbers here, just a few. Um, we're, like I said, we are using social media more than anyone else. 80% um, of Black women have smartphones, and that's 8% higher than white women, non-Hispanic white women right? So we are out here having these smartphones. And I, and I, you know, I thought about this. I was like, well, why, why do we have these more, right? We, um, we're not making the same amount of money. We're not necessarily getting access to the same opportunities. Why do we have these smartphones more? And I think about the utility of them and how much can get done and how much more affordable it may be for a, a Black woman to have a smartphone versus a laptop right, or an iPad or something like that, um, and get, being able to get all of that utility. So we have, we are the group that um, has the most smartphones. And because of that, we have a higher utility, right? So Black women spend about 19 hours and 27 minutes uh, per week on, you know, using apps and scrolling online. That is more than any other um, women's group. Um, and then 72% uh, of Black women use Facebook. That is our biggest, our most widely used uh, platform again. And if you go on Facebook, you know your auntie and your grandma is on there and they don't necessarily know what they're doing all the time. And they want, they want to like all your pictures and they want to put like eight comments. I love you. Why you look nice? Oh, you're amazing on the same photo, right? But it's okay, because that's community, right? And so if you were at the barbecue, she would probably tell you three times that you look good in your outfit. So that's kind of what they do. And that's that's wonderful, right? It's a preservation of community. We have to look at Facebook that way. We have to look at Facebook as a living archive. We have to look at Facebook, um, particularly when it shows memories and things like that. And when we contextualize that within uh, what just happened with COVID, what's been going on with COVID, all the loss that we have, this is a way of creating kind of pub, creating and preserving public memory. And Black women really are kind of driving that as well, um, because we will definitely share that memory, especially when we broke up with that no good so and so. Like, yep, I moved on, girl. I moved on. And then all your friends are going to come in and be like, you sure did. And we were there with you. I remember that. And we supported you through that, right? This is not necessarily something we were able to do 30 years ago. You might get on the phone with one person. You might be able to get a couple of people together. But if you went away to college, for example, or if your friends were scattered, it wasn't as easy to get everybody together. And what Black women have been doing is utilizing social media to bring people together in the same space at the same time and be able to support and show love for each other. And I think that that's powerful. So they say 19 hours and 27 minutes a week. Some people may be like, oh, that's a lot. But when you really think about it, you think about, oh, I'm picking up my phone real quick. I'm just, oh, my friends texted me. Let me text back, put it back down. Oh, let me check what's going on Twitter. You know, it, it, it adds up. It's not like we're all just like kind of sitting there just like for eight hours out the day. It adds up and it's okay. We're on the go too. So we're constantly moving. Um, I think I remember something, I, and I couldn't find it today, but we're a lot more physically mobile than other people as well. So that would also explain why the smartphones make more sense. And I got this uh, these statistics from Nielsen. So why, right? Conversation. That was what really started all of this. It was really just about conversation. I don't know how many of you here are, are old like me, but we're on Facebook in 2004 when it dropped, you know what I mean? And, and have been ever since, oh, almost 20 years now. Uh, that we're going on on being on Facebook, people wanting to connect. I joined Facebook because I wanted to connect with my friends that I went to college with that I maybe lost a little contact with since we graduated. 
Um, and that's what a lot of people were using it for. It's really to have the conversation. In the early days of Twitter, I always tell people I joined Twitter because I saw that Questlove from The Roots was on there and I wanted to be able to talk to him. Like I found, I was like, oh, I can send him a message directly and he'll see it. You know, Twitter was like, we can bring, you know, celebrities right into your house, right into your phone. And we were all like, really? And we can talk to them? Oh my gosh. And like, I really did tweet him. And I was like, hi, <laughs> and we're cool now, <laughs> you know, but it was like, it was like Twitter really like, took the world from being like up here and brought it real like really close. And that was the early appeal. The platform itself was terrible to use, but it was, it was really that, like, let's bring people together. Let's have conversation. A celebrity would say something, people would respond. Or, you know, some bloggers would say something, people would respond. And people like myself, you know, who we were out there writing and blogging, I was like, well, hey, we got folks listening to us. Let's start sharing some more of our thoughts. And that really created conversation and started connecting us with people, not just around the country, but around the world. So I realized that I had uh, sisters on the continent and sisters in the UK and sisters in the Caribbean who are reading my stuff and sending me messages. And I'm like, I don't know you from a can of paint, but I know you a black woman. So you're my sister, what's good? And that really has been the tone that we have been taking when it comes to using social media. Um, Another thing that people have been using, sisters have been using for is business promotion and career advancement. So let's think about what it means to be a black woman in this world, right? You have everybody and their mama trying to stop you from being great. And one of the things that social media has been able to do is, is not necessarily level the playing field, but you know, close the gap quite a bit. So women who believe that, you know what, I don't know if anybody will ever care about, you know, my vegan burger that I got right now are now like making millions of dollars serving vegan burgers out of food trucks, <laughs> you know? Or women who were like, I just always wanted to be a writer, but I don't even know how to get in with any of these publications. Now have bylines like me, you know, in the New York Times and Washington Post and all these places that I got, Ebony and Essence that I grew up on my table, you know, like now all of a sudden I'm writing for them, <laughs> like writing about hip hop for them. Like this was amazing. And so many uh, sisters, this is their way in, right? Where, and especially when you look at publishing and books, they were not checking for us. Nobody's trying to give us these book deals, but now when they see how popular we are, they see how many followers we have, they see how many people's attention we have, then they're like, oh, well, we want you to do this. And so that has been pivotal for us. Um, and then we create community around that too, because now we're all kind of like, we're all writing together. Our books are all on the shelves together. We're doing panels together. We're, you know, we're, we're addressing a lot of these larger issues together. Whereas many of us who were activists before this, were kind of working in silos, right? Um, career advancement. Who do you know? Who, who's plugging who? Who, you know, I'm in these rooms with so-and-so and so-and-so and, -so and they're saying, hey, you know, can you come and do this? I'm like, you know what? That's not my lane, but I know a sister that I just met or I've, I've been talking to on Twitter for three years. That's her area of expertise. You need to go talk to her, right? So it's changing that game, this thing that white folks have had all these years, this nepotism, these connections, this word of mouth. We are now able to do this because of the digital connections that we have made online and it's been amazing. And if you wanna, and, and let's not even talk about all the black women businesses that I support from the shea butter to the jewelry, to the clothes, to the bundles. If you, if you want something that a sister is making on, on social media, you gonna find it. And that has been fantastic because the sister in rural Georgia who really did not have access to this is now able to have a business at home and be at home with her babies while she can do this because social media has afforded her the opportunity to do that. So that's amazing. And I think the biggest, in my uh, opinion, don't, you know, don't say that's for everybody, has been activism. Um, I, I can't even, I, I, as somebody who has been an activist for, oh gosh, 24 years now, <laughs> you know, kind of starting in the streets, handing out these flyers, like, come to this rally, come to this, come support this. Now to be able to go online and click, 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 and then there's 100 people showing up, it's, I mean, it's been transformative. And I write about that in the book, like how important this has been to organizing and activism and social justice coalition building, right? If you think about something like the March on Washington, 
and how long it took them to plan that march and to get all the speakers and to get the permits and all these things and to have people organizing in their cities and you know all of that stuff to get it together i mean you're talking months of planning for these kinds of things right then we can do something like the national moment of silence which i'd organize in four days because i use twitter and facebook and, and, and we're talking like over 100,000 people in 45 states and five countries coming together at the same time. And that was organized in four days. That is unheard of if you don't have social media, right? And from that, I would, you know, we were able to create all these new activists <laughs> that came out of this, right? People who had never done any stuff like this before were inspired now, and they have gone on to be really amazing activists and doing great work in the spaces to uplift our people. So stuff like that is super important, and Black women really have been leading the charge with that. So I want to look at a couple of things from around the world. As I said, um, you know, all around the world, women of the diaspora have been using social media to raise awareness about social issues and advocate for social change. Being able to spread messages to people and activists in other nations has expanded awareness and increased support. And so one thing I want, I want to start with South Africa. And the reason I start with South Africa is because um, back in 2013, um, okay. back in 2013, I went to South Africa, was it 2014? I went to South Africa. And when I went there, I was welcomed by women I'd never met before in my life. But when they heard, I just happened to randomly talk about Twitter. I was like, I'm going to South Africa. I had sisters reaching out, you can come stay with me, come have dinner with me. I'll take care of you, don't worry about it. We got you, we love you over here. And I was just like, what? <laughs> right, like what? Like, how do you know who I am, you know? because of social media. These women felt a fondness for me and a respect for me and were willing to welcome their, would like welcome me into their homes. And so I will always have love for my South African sisters. I will also say that um, South Africa Twitter has really been like, in my opinion, ground zero for a lot of activist work online. If you're not plugged in, that's on you, okay? For many of us, there's six to nine hours ahead of time, but that doesn't mean that you can't get plugged in. So there was a movement, Remember Kwezi, um, Kwezi was a woman who um, accused the president of sexual assault. Um, she died and the women came together because a lot of the activism in um, South Africa is around, is around um, sexual assault um, and femicide. The numbers out there are just so discouraging and, and heartbreaking. And these women are literally fighting for their lives every single day. Um, the hashtag rape must fall came after um, the roads must fall uh, movement, and you can look into that as well. University students, young students. South Africa has a long history of students fighting for their rights. Um, so these these women, you know, and 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 men, all people really, but it's led by women who are just like they they can't they can't live with the sexual violence. Like they they cannot do this, and so they are crying out and fighting, and we have to pay attention and we have to support them. Um, in Brazil, Brazil, where Black women make up 27% of the population, they are the largest demographic in Brazil. Um, they have come together in so many ways. I couldn't, I couldn't fit it all <laughs> into one thing. But there were two that came up for me that I thought were important. So that's El Now, and that is their protest against um, Bolsonaro, um, Bolsonaro and his fascism. Uh, black women have, uh, it's Portuguese for not him, and, and Black women have really, really um, taken lead in this protest and standing up against this. Because again, Black women make up 27% of the population, but less than 0.5% of congressional seats. So they have no representation in their government. They're dealing with the fascism. And, you know, who's going to get this, the harsh, the most harsh treatment is going to be those that are Black and those that are women, those that are disabled, those that are queer, et cetera. So these women are, are standing up and they're fighting against this and using this particular hashtag. Um, Papo de Preta, which is basically a Black woman chat, uh, it's a YouTube channel and they have 180,000 subscribers, which is huge for Black women on YouTube. And they talk about everything from um, pop culture to natural hair care, to colorism, activism, things like that. You'll go on there and you'll see sisters of all shades and textures and everything covering, um, commenting. I saw a recent video that was talking about Ariel being black and like they're in Brazil and they're, they're like, what about it? You know what? We deserve to be mermaids too. You know, like it's not just a US centric thing. And I think it's super important to recognize that sisters are really around the, the world doing this kind of work. 
but this is a really strong community and, and their, their audience loves what they do. And so they're bringing black women together to chat and that's super important. Uh, we come hop over to the United States. Uh, we have Black Girl Magic started by actually my friend, Kashawn Thompson, who is pictured there. She started it as Black Girls Are Magic, as you can see um, in her shirt. Um, Black Girl Magic, you can't go to any corner of this earth and not hear that term. And this was all started by a, a, a woman from DC, grew up poor in DC, um, no formal higher education, single teen mom, started this movement to, to change how we think about ourselves as Black women. And despite the pushback, you know, she's maintained strong over the years that, you know, it's not just about Black excellence or whatever, you know, respectability stuff that that is. It's not just about um, believing in the esoteric and supernatural. It's just the fact that we are magic and we make things happen. And that's the Black bottom line. <laughs> um, and I love her to death for that and um, have been supporting her for 10 years now with this movement. Um, and then there's the OK Sis. Somebody you know may have created that. I don't know her name, whatever. So, um, but it's a global movement um, to, to talk about street harassment and to, to combat street harassment um, that directly has an impact on Black and brown women. Um, I started this in 2014. Um, I just got tired of it. I've been talking about street harassment publicly since about 2010. But I just kind of got to the, my breaking point, I think. And I put out a rallying call for us to, to confront this and, and become you know, intervening bystanders. And I basically developed a framework for bystander intervention that centers uh, the victims and doesn't focus on confronting the perpetrators. Um, and that was a new way of thinking about street harassment. And this is expanded to include domestic violence. Um, I have done trainings around the country and around the world. Um, never accepted a dime for it. People have tried to exploit it and use it for money and all this other stuff. That's not what that's about, but it's really important to have these conversations. And so when you, if you were to go online, like say between 2014, 2018, you'd see still lots of conversations with women saying, you know what, I just, I just got street harassed. This man made me feel really bad. And I just really icky right now. And they would use the hashtag and other people would come in and say, we're here for you. We support you. You know, what can we do right now to make you feel better? Or they would send her love and things like that. That's what community building is about. And a lot of times when you deal with stuff like that, you just need somebody to, to, to immediately just say, it's going to be okay. And we got your back. So that's what sisters are really doing with a lot of these hashtags. You think of why I stayed um, which is a conversation about why uh, survivors of domestic violence stayed with abusive people. Um, you think of Me Too, which was started by Tarana Burke. And while that, you know, covers people of all cultures, um, it really, we have to remember that it was started by, you know, this, this, this sister who was uh, operating primarily with sisters and doing that. So we always, we, we salute the origin stories. Um, if we go up to Canada, our people to the north, you've got Tanya Hales up there. And so this is more, this is less about activism and more about community building. She has uh, created this community of over 10,000 women. Um, it is based in Canada, but there are women all from all over the world. Um, I'm actually a member of this Facebook group and this community that she has done um, because Black women need to talk about motherhood in ways that are outside of that white gaze. Um, historically, we have felt that we have to you know, kind of prove that we're good mothers because uh, out of fear of our children being taken away by a racist uh, social <laughs> work <laughs> field or being sold into slavery, right? We have this fear that if we don't show that we are the best mothers, our children will be taken away. And so it's hard for us to talk about, you know, I messed up today or I'm experiencing depression or I don't want to be a mom today, you know? And so she's kind of created this, this community where Black mothers can come together and really support each other, and it is, it is uh, fantastic. Um, and so it is. we are halfway, and I do want to open this up for discussion. I think I'm putting the Q&A, but I want to stop sharing because I just want to be able to, to see folks. Um, and so what I want to say to kind of like wrap that up is that, um, you know, when I think about what it means to have community, when I think about the access and why so many things like kind of Negative, when ne negative things happen to us, we tend to deal with it like as individuals. That is not our African way of being. That is not who we are. We are communal people. We are meant to experience life together. We are meant to grow together. And so being able to find community with people who have shared experiences across the world, right? It's not just me, it's not just us, 
but we are fighting against the same systems, right? These colonial systems, these oppressive systems that have been harming us. And we are able to come together and find strength in each other and, and communicate and talk and build. And we can map out actual plans. You think of like the Kambahi River Collective and these people kind of coming together and saying, we're gonna develop a politic. And you think of these different groups and these mind melds that come together. Social media has become that for many of us now to be able to come together. How are we gonna address this issue? Police brutality has been a really big one for the last few years. And some of the, the top thinkers and contributors to this have been black women and women of the African diaspora. So how do we come together and, and, and build community and build coalition to address these issues so we're working towards liberation? And that is where I think that social media can be powerful. But on the downside, is that we are the ones most subjected to the violence and the harassment and the negative sides of social media. And, and I'd be remiss if I didn't say that. I actually have a piece in the New York Times about online harassment and the toll that it takes on us. Um, please go look that up and read it. Um, I have experienced it. Um, anytime you come out and say, I love women and I'm supporting women, people will try to destroy you because it goes against the status quo. You say, I love being Black to the day I die. People want you to be silenced. You know what I mean? I'm also pansexual. You talk about this. There's all these things that people will try to silence you, right? And they do that with harassment. They do that with these, like, is the trolling and the negative comments and, you know, threatening you and what they call doxing when they expose your address and your phone number. I've had to move, I've had to change my phone number. I Like where I live right now, I say Philadelphia base. I do not live in Philadelphia, um, but I have to do that to protect myself and my child, right? That's the downside of, you know, social media. One person posted a picture of my kid's school online, you know, and kind of called for people to meet me there. And, and, and I, you know, so that's the downside of it. But we navigate that because I think it's a net positive when we really think about the impact that it has had. So I just wanted to you know, wrap that up a little bit. I am more than open to questions and conversation, comments. Anybody has any thoughts? Um, again, I am super, super happy to be here. Uh, so let's let's get into it. Uh, Hi. I just wanted to say, first of all, that's phenomenal. Um, my name is Aisha, and um, I'm, you just lit a fire under me because my research is um, diversity, equity, and inclusion. And now I'm trying to figure out what the heck, where do I do? What do I do now? Because I need to continue on with my research, which is I'm in the process of doing, but I have a passion for women too, for black women, especially because, and I often try to express like a lot of things to either my students, my colleagues, or just like my sister friends, my family, you know, because the issues that we deal with are so different from what other women deal with who are not women of color. And the um, stigmas, all these things that we come up against, but we still we still be having on top, like hey, you know, we still be happy, we still like, you know, we love everyone, you know, we treat everyone well, but who supports us? Mm, mm, yes, and that's where that's where that community comes in, right? Um, over the last two months, like within my like little circle on Twitter, like we've all gone through breakups in our relationships and we're all like, what is happening right now? We're like all over 40. We're like, what is happening? And we've like have our little private chats and, and community now. And these are people that I've never met. I've never met them in person, but I've known them online for years and we know each other. We know each other's children's names. We watch them grow and we, we, we built that. And now I like, I can talk to these women. They like, you know what I mean? So if it wasn't for them, it's like really hard to get through some tough times. So that's what we do. We have, we adapt, we adjust, but not just for like survival. We do it to thrive. And we, you know, I always say like, we all, we got, you know, we got it. We got to be here. Nobody knows us like us. And so that community and that connection that we're able to make with people from different countries. Like, it don't even matter. There's just something, sister girl, that's like, I got you. And yes. it's so powerful. And I think people are threatened by that because yeah. when you think about the power that, that Black women wield, right? You know, whether it's politically or whatever, like socially, they get a little nervous when we come yeah. together like this. They, they do. And I mean, for negative reasons, of course, we know that. 
Um, but, you know, set aside from that, we still rock. We still continue to do whatever we need to do. And the, the I, you know, just the recently, the other day, I just saw that um, the oldest bones that were found were a Black woman. Mm -hmm. And so I sit and I think about, you know, where we've come from, the struggles we have, whose shoulders we have stood upon, Black and Black women and Black men. And I still know that we can still do way more than what we're doing now, right? So, I mean, you just live by I just want to say that I appreciate um, everything that you shared. I'm getting ready to get your audio book. Oh, thank you. <laughs> That's thank what you. I was looking for now. And yeah. then I hope we'll be able to keep in contact since part of what I do is something that um, I would like to do with other people, of course. Mm -hmm. But I just don't know where to start yet. No, I get it. Um, so I, I do some of that as well. Um, so when I do DEI talks or whatever, I always give them what they're not asking for. They want the the status quo, we got to meet these kind of things. And I come in, I disrupt everything. And I, I call it out, especially when I do social work stuff. So I do a lot of DEI stuff within social work and organizations and training and facilitating for them. And I'm just like, I just need to remind you all that social work is one of the most racist professions that exists. Um, and they're like, what? And I'm like, um, yeah, it is. <laughs> and let's let's yeah. talk about it though, right? Let's let's get into that. Um, and and I, I I come from that place. We have to be ready to blow it up. We have to be be ready to be disruptive. We have to like put aside a lot of these other you know capitalist gains and tensions and really start thinking about liberation. What does liberation look like? You know what I mean. And that's what we go for. So I'm with it. Uh, there's a hand. Well, there was a question in the chat, and then I just want to address that before we go to Tanya. Okay. Um, what do you feel needs to happen for us to better understand the social media landscape? to transition the work we've done in the field online? That is an excellent question. Um, one of the things I often talk about is how I was an activist before I was on social media. So I, I always resent when people call me a social media activist because that's annoying. Um, I, I, social media is a tool. It is a, it is a force, like literally media. It's various mediums, you know, for us to do the work that we are already doing. So when I think about myself as an organizer, somebody who already knew how to have meetings with people and plan out you know, direct actions and here's what we're going to be doing. Boom, 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 this is your job, your job, your job. You know, Here's the flyers, here's whatever. We could do all of that. Now social media, it just makes it a little bit easier. You know, I can type stuff and do graphics and share them widely. And probably, you know, instead of catching 250 people, I can get the attention of 250,000 people, right? That's the main difference. So what you're doing, what, what people need to do is they need to do training in social media. I do that kind of stuff. I help um, uh, organizers uh, become digital organizers. I help um, activists become digital activists because it is a bit of a transition, but it does take some education and really learning the landscape. Um, you've got to really dig deep into the, the numbers, who's using what, when, like I know, for example, if you want traction, you need to post something between 10 a.m. and 1 p.m. on Eastern Standard Time or from 3 p.m. to 5 p.m. on Eastern Standard Time if you want to get the visuals. These are things that you kind of have to know and you learn that through studying it. Um, so I definitely recommend that people kind of look into Don't take it lightly. Like people think social media is, is a game, is a joke. It's not. Like you're studying comms, you know, this is communications. Yeah, people are getting paid six figures to be able to figure out how to help organizations get better with their social media. So I do a lot of training as, as well as a consultant. Um, but that's that's what has to happen. You can't, you're not just gonna be able to pick it up and say, oh, we're gonna go online and no. <laughs> you have to get some education. All right, Tanya, please. Okay, hi. Um, guess what? For some reason, my um okay, so guess what? I am happy to be here. I'm gonna just tell you something. Um, I just want to say something to you. Um, I'm sorry that you experienced that type of behavior, right? I acknowledge it. I'm so, so sorry, right? That human beings were that mean to share your information, to bring your children. And that's a part of trauma within itself mm -hmm. that required processing. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and it also is a way to try to thwart, you know, any level of you know, um, you know, your humanity and any activism that you have, right? He says there to diminish that. So I'm sorry that that happened. So let me just tell you, I heard that and I was like, dang, right? Um, but now here is something that um, I'm, I wanna ask you about. It, it is a sort of a sensitive um, area, I mean, a sensitive topic. 
And that is the domestic violence piece. So when I am telling people and talking with people about domestic violence, what now they have these studies that show that women are just as much as aggressive of, of, of men. And I've been in forums where, you know, um, and I've seen conversations and I've been sent data that basically talk about that, you know, that, you know, it always, the story, the traditional story was that women were the, you know, the victims, but what they're, what this, these new studies are showing, or at least the ones I'm being sent is that women are just as much as aggressive um, when it comes down to domestic violence as men. What do you say to that? Particularly, the reason I want to say that, I want, to, I want you to ask if you, can, if you can answer that question, but the reason that I'm bringing this up is because I know that people can marginalize the um, and dismiss, right, our struggles. And when that have come up to me and I receive those articles, you know, I'm just sort of like, okay, um, you know, and I have worked around it, but what say you when people present that type of information? Nobody presents that to me because they know better. I'm, first thing I'm going to ask is where is this coming from? First, second thing I'm going to ask who did the study and what kind of study was it? You know what I mean? I'm always going to critique those things because that's quite shocking to me to go from, you know, closing a gap of like, you know, one in four <laughs> to now trying to say just as aggressive. What does that language even mean? Right. So these are the things that's what I that's what I would be doing. I would be questioning, like, what are you talking about? Where is this coming from? Who funded this? You know, what is is, is there an agenda here? Because reality says quite different. Now, that's not to say that women cannot be perpetrators of domestic violence. In fact, they actually are. And we know this, like, and domestic violence goes beyond intimate partner violence, right? It goes to children and family and siblings and things like that. And, you know, people can be susceptible to that. And I can definitely see changes as we are growing um, a more aggressive society, actually. And I think in my own opinion, a lot of it is because we're overstimulated. Um, our brains were never meant to process any of this that we're doing right now. Um, and I don't think that we've caught up. Um, I think that there's a lot of overstimulation. I think there's a lot of things, stressors and things that people are dealing with more stressors than they ever have before. And I think that that's um, making anyone susceptible to kind of lashing out and, and those kinds of things. I think we need healing. I think we need um, support. We need way more um, modalities than people are using. Like talk therapy is, is a popular thing and people are like, go to therapy, almost weaponizing it. But we're not thinking about you know, the other uh, forms of treatment that could help people. Um, I, I, my, I would, my, my, third, my first thing is to be skeptical about that. Um, for someone to say that women are just as aggressive as men when all the other statistics about vi just violence in general, don't back that up. Um, you look at the, the overwhelming majority of violence committed in this world is committed by men. Um, so it, to, to single out domestic violence as a thing that women are now on par with men, it doesn't make any sense to me. Um, so I would be critical of those articles and those studies. And I, I'd wanna learn more about that. That's what I would say. I would not take that at face value. Thank you. And let me just say one more thing. I know that you, then probably the next question is coming up, but let me tell you, you're like sunshine. Oh, I'm telling you, you're bright. <laughs> the energy and the intellect and the light sort. You are truly a breath of um, fresh and, and good air. Oh, thank you. I appreciate that. You know, I think I thank you very much. <laughs> I'm glad to feel that way. You know, I'm 43 years old. Hope I can still keep it going, you know, keep it ticking. Um, does anybody else have any more questions? Questions, reactions, comments, thoughts, things like that. Thoughts. I have, I have twenty. I have, I have 20, but I want others. Yes, whoever that is, go ahead. It's Cynthia. I had a quick comment. I just wanted to respond to Tanya's comment that, you know, the men have had the power and the money. Um, so the aggression there was always supported in a greater way and they could move and control um, women in different ways. So that's the aspect too, that we um, just have to remember when those kinds of things come up. But I just wanted to say thanks. This is um, very enlightening. I am a recent, I, I wouldn't say recent, I, I was a Facebooker for our birthdays and fun stuff and, you know, pictures of my daughter and, you know, all that kind of crazy, you, you know, um, foolishness, I, I call it, but fun foolishness. But I think I've come into um, a different place about what so social media can and should be doing. So this is just very timely for me. So this is um, food for thought. And I'm so glad that I um, 
was able to join Mondays. It turned out to be a challenge for me, but I'm trying to make it happen each time we have this. But this was very helpful, very informative. And I may be reaching out to you because I think there's so much more we should do. And yes, social work is a racist profession. And I, am I mean, the they state. all are pretty much, but they all, yeah, <laughs> you know, but as a social work educator, I am greatly challenged with addressing it. Not because I don't want to, or because I don't, but because I see it as a growing issue, yeah. as opposed to us getting better. Mm -hmm. Because the country is getting worse, the students are coming from places that are worse. Or um, so you you know I think um, you know that's a very real comment uh, and or a perspective or reality and one that I am am working on on a daily basis. Yeah, thank you so much for that. Um, we have some uh, questions in the comments that I you know in the in the chat that I want to get to. Um, but we, so I, I actually am one of those people, I don't know if the world is getting worse. I just think we're exposed to more of the bad. We're exposed, things. right, right. Yeah. We're seeing Because I, I, don't, I don't know if we're acting any yeah. worse than we ever have. Yeah. We just know more that's about true. it. And we're more conscious about it now. Because Absolutely of this. And that's why true. I said the overstimulation, like we were not yeah. meant to have this 24 seven news cycle and right. to be constantly inundated with traumatic videos and photos and things like that. And I want this to turn the light back on. Let's. Okay, <laughs> we, 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 us, we're not handling that well, right? You know, so, you know, there's, there's that aspect. Okay, so let's get into these questions real quick. Um, and I have, this is Tanya Tim Taylor. After you finish those, I do have one more question. So I'm sorry, I just want to- you mind to putting it in the chat so I can like okay. read it? It's so much easier for mm -hmm. me to do that. Thank, uh, you. thank you so much. Uh, can you speak to how schools might be able to syst uh, systemically or systematically help our young women use social media to empower them? Um, schools can offer classes in it, right? Um, and so a lot of times they may ask someone like me to come in and do like special seminars or things like that. But actually there are more schools that are actually offering like classes, high schools that are, um, my son's uh, high school offers a uh, class in social media management um, and teaching young people how to use uh, social media responsibly. He's an artist, um, he's a musician and he's you know taking it to learn how to better promote his music online. So some schools are doing that. And if there's resources for that, I would encourage schools to do that. I would also encourage um, teachers to work it into their curriculum, um, just because there's so many ways that you, even if you're talking about history, you can work in social media into that. Um, and really, it could be a lesson on debunking a lot of the nonsensical things that people write on social media. Um, people will write these really long threads about history, things that happened in history that didn't really happen. So, but nobody fact checks because nobody reads because we have a sixth grade reading level now. And so, you know, it's a lot of those things that I think that educators can do. Um, in terms terms of using it for young women to empower them, um, really, we have to move them away from the, the peer pressure bullying and, and things like that, um, and really improving their self-esteem and, and got to get them off of Instagram, <laughs> I'm going to be honest. Instagram has been shown to destroy people's self-esteem, especially our young women. Um, There's another question. Uh, let's see. Please share your observations on challenges of addressing violence against women around the world, considering paternalistic societies, for example, are we reacted in positive ways across the globe to this problem through social media? Um, you know what? It, it's, that's, that's such, it's like emptying an ocean with a teaspoon. And that's what I was also going to say to Cynthia um, about dealing with a lot of the stuff that comes with social work and these other kinds of activist things. It can be extremely overwhelming especially when you become aware of all the stuff that is happening, that it's not just the United States issue, it's not just the South Africa issue, it's everywhere. And that is incredibly overwhelming. Um, it can make people wanna give up, right? Um, that's, that's one of the, the biggest challenges is like, are we ever going to fix this? Are we ever going to be able to get to a society where women are not being stoned to death because someone sexually assaulted them, or women are not wanting to stay in the house because they're afraid that if they go outside, a group of men is gonna take them somewhere. Are we ever gonna get to that place? Um, and some days you're like, I don't know, I'm not so sure that we will. So that poses a challenge, motivation, inspiration, energy to keep going. Um, those are big challenges. I think one of the benefits of social media is, like I said, with building the community, you feel like you're not as alone. Um, I do think that we've had some positive changes uh, with social media and, and kind of dealing with these things. If you look at Me Too, um, as much as people talk down about it, it has been a very powerful vehicle um, for helping people come forward with things and building community and solidarity. Um, 
even if you look at things like Black Lives Matter, despite the issues with, you know, the organization itself, it has become a global rallying cry um, that is that has motivated people. If we can continue to build these kind of global communities, this, this global solidarity and getting everybody educated and on the same mind and, and pathway towards liberation, I think we can. But we have to, I mean, the deprogramming that has to happen, this patriarchal condition and this white supremacist, you know, conditioning is, is what we talking like millennia that we have to overcome, you know, like it's, it's, it's hard, but that's why we keep working. That's why we wake up every day and we keep fighting because we know that we're a part of this movement. There's people that came before us. There are people that are going to come after us. Our job while we're here on this earth is just to move things forward. Um, and I think that was there any more questions. Let me see. Uh, can't see in this um, okay. Uh, how did your children, how did your children respond to the harassment and bullying? Um, the move, my son, um, is not as aware of things. My son used to come to protest with me, but I stopped letting him come because of this. Um, the move, yes, financial, I had to buy a house, I bought a house <laughs> and I had to move and get, you know, get out of Philly. Um, cause I actually have a stalker in Philly. Uh, who came very close, a little too close to me, and the police have done nothing, right? So um, it is financially, I mean, I think I do okay. So I have that privilege, right? You know, that I could actually say, hmm, I'm going to go buy a house and have the resources to do that. Not everybody has that, and we have to be conscious of that. I grew up in poverty, so I've never lost sight of what that means to, to not have those things. That's why community care and mutual aid is super important, and Black women are also leading the charge with organizing that online as well. If you're looking online to help people, all you got to do is find Black women with large accounts. They will be often sharing, this person needs money, they need money, they need help, they need help to get out of you know abusive situations. I donate as much as I can because again, we all we got can't rely on the government can't, you know, it's really about community care. So um, that's how a lot of us are, are working around that. Somebody joked and said, we all send around the same $20, you know, to each other because somebody gave us 20. So we get 20 when we got it. And that's what it's really supposed to be about. Right. Um, we created these global susus. <laughs> it's kind of fantastic. Um, yeah, so I don't I don't know if I see. Um, well, wait, I'm grappled by the social work is racist comment. I'm wondering why or where such a narrative is coming from. Um, because social work, if you remember the origins of social work, um, it's from Europe and the white people wanting to create a polite society and get rid of the the blemishes. And so they created social work as a way of cleaning up society so that the polite people wouldn't have to deal with seeing people on the streets houseless and people going hungry. And so social workers created to kind of clean things up. So it's classes and races in origin. And then it has moved into, if we look at the United States and the history of that, come on, like, let's look at how <laughs> destructive social work has been on Black families and Black communities. Um, I often say that when uh, Black children go into school and they have these white women standing in the front of their classrooms as their teacher, many of them are triggered because they look a lot like the white women that came and took their sister from them or came and took their brother from them or came and took them out of their house away from their parents when they were three and they haven't forgotten that. See, we don't, we don't think about that. We have to think about the, as a somebody who was working in housing and, and having to deal with my superiors, showing less empathy to our black veterans than our white veterans, for example. You know, me trying to advocate for the black veterans and them throwing money at the white veterans. Listen, I've done it and I've been there and for oh, very many, 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 many years. Like I said, I'm retired. So I was doing that for a long time. And it's very clear, even the modalities of treatment are not culturally conscious. They center whiteness and white experience. And the white universe, the European universality is supposed to be applied to all of us. They do not consider um, African cultural consciousness. They do not consider African ways of being and healing and treatments, right? They don't do any of that kind of stuff. So we have to do, we may do it as individuals, but as a, as a field, no. So they call us delusional if we talk to spirit guides. Come on, that's again, it's we have to look at these things and, and that's why I say it's racist. <laughs> so, right. but we can counter that. Like we go into these spaces and we can disrupt them and we can push back against that, right? And we can do our work to develop scholarship that moves away from that, that is anti-racist and that's our jobs, right? So that's, that's why I say that. 
actually, I'm going to pause you. Uh, we could keep you for another yeah, we could. four oh God, hours. Time. We yes. really could. First, let me just <laughs> extend a unmuted round of applause for Thank your you. intellect, you. your insight, your energy, your openness, your comfort, and uh, the amount of uh, work and information you shared. Um, so many times when you were speaking, I wanted to unmute and yell and clap in the African way. But I didn't because it would have taken you off course, but it, it, it was great to do. Um, secondly, I want to encourage others to, uh, first and foremost, to purchase, to pick up, to read her books and materials, and to invite her back in other uh, formats and venues, and also to share the world, uh, share the world, world, share with the world about what she's doing, and also to join her on the media platform. Just a quick caveat, if you haven't heard that social work, psychology, and many other so-called professions in America are homophobic, sexist, racist, you, you've been in the wrong classes or you, or you haven't had the right team. That should not be new information. That, that, that should not be new. That should, you, and if you haven't heard that America was founded on racism, you've been in the wrong, history classes. So this shouldn't be a, a new thing for you to hear. Um, what we try to do, those of us who are in the field, is that we want to change it. We want to dismantle. We want to disrupt. We want to organize. We want to put forth the Afrocentric ideas, womanist, feminist ideas, other queer models. So if you don't know that, now you know. Now so you know. <laughs> uh, yeah, now you know. If that's a new epiphany, good. Then you, you were at the right meeting at the right time, because that's an old song for a lot of us old souls. So again, I want to thank you. We will post a YouTube link um, for the video in the next 24 hours. But most importantly, uh, Professor Michelle Taylor, I want to thank you so much for your time, your energy, and your work. And I encourage you to be safe in the world. And I hope to see you soon, yes. if not here, somewhere else in the world. world. Thank, thank you so you. much for your time. I appreciate it. Asante Everybody, Sana. Thank you so much. I'm going to Thank get you, everybody, for coming. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Be well. Be safe. Bye. Thanks for coming, everybody. Yeah. And like most of you, I'm off to four more meetings. <laughs> Take care, everybody. Okay.